This was the moment which ended the 1989 season, a season of controversy and bitterness. So-called teammates Alan Prost and Ayrton Senna collide at Suzuka. Prost wins the title. At Adelaide in the last race of the year, Prost refuses to race because of the conditions. All the drivers agree and threaten a boycott, but one man breaks the strike. Senna insists on racing, but to no avail, as he careered blind into Brundle's Brabham while leading, turning the McLaren into a tricycle. No hint of rain at Phoenix as the teams gathered in the Arizona desert for the start of a new season, hopeful that the weather would be matched by a new era of understanding in the pit lane. At least the quarrelers had been separated, Prost settling in with Ferrari after his departure from McLaren, with team boss Cesare Fiorio looking on like a proud parent. Prost had said that Ferrari were the only team who could challenge McLaren. And Nigel Mansell seemed happy with his new teammate Prost. Mansell here greeting former Ferrari star Mario Andretti, who approved the merger, as did Nigel. Yeah, it's a fantastic start of the new year. We've done a lot of homework over the winter and... Uh, you know, put an extraordinary amount of time and effort into it. So um, we look for the new year with great expectations. Of course, you've done some sensational times in testing, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, it, it is incredible, actually. I mean, we've lowered uh, some of the outright track records by about three seconds. And, uh, you know, in the winter, you expect maybe one second or so, but three seconds is, uh, is quite extraordinary. For Ayrton Senna, the repercussions of his angry end to the previous season had lasted long after the final race. Even his license had been in doubt weeks before Phoenix, but the Brazilian seemed anxious to put the bad times behind him. 1990 is 1990 and uh, we are here Phoenix and uh, we are here for racing and that's what should take place. Um, we have a long season, very competitive more than before and I think it's going to be exciting for everybody. and. Difficult for everybody that is looking for winning. Alongside Senna, a new face, Gerhard Berger, having moved from Ferrari to squeeze into a McLaren cockpit, which was simply too small for him. Frank Williams had kept the same faces for 1990. Italian Riccardo Patrese was heading for his 200th Grand Prix. And Belgian Thierry Boutsen had had the whole of the close season to savour his victory in the rain at Adelaide. There were some new faces too. Gary Brabham, son of three times world champion Sir Jack, was at the wheel of the new life. The fragile and underfinanced Italian car powered by a strange W12 engine. And Portly, Formula 3000 exponent Claudio Lange would also be a pre-qualifier this year alongside Roberto Moreno in the Eurobrun. Two drivers were playing the role of substitute. Official Ferrari test driver Gianni Morbidelli in for hepatitis-stricken Emanuele Pirro in the Dallara. And Bernd Schneider took charge of the second footwork arrows in place of Alex Caffey, injured in a motorcycle accident. But Schneider's inexperience showed when the practice rain caught out the young German, sending him skating into the unforgiving walls. Afterwards, looking for a cure for a headache and a bent footwork arrows. Gerhard Berger was out to impress his new bosses, and he did it by taking provisional pole position on Friday, using every inch of the desert track. But the story of the day was Pierluigi Martini's performance in the unfancied Minardi, defying the pundit's predictions to take second place. Andrea de Cesaris must be more accustomed than most to having to explain away an accident now and then, but the sweetener for Dallara was his performance in qualifying, recording the third fastest time. Yet another unusual face completed the second row. Young John Alesi produced another electrifying display in the Tyrrell, despite its considerable power deficiency, to record the fourth fastest time of the day. Ayrton Senna is the unquestioned master of the flying lap, and everyone expected the McLaren driver to claim the pole in Phoenix. But it wasn't to be. The Brazilian had suffered electrical troubles, and then complained of strange engine noises. He could do no better than fifth place. Another Brazilian took a provisional share of the third row. Nelson Piquet had trouble with traffic for most of the day and wasn't happy with his flying laps, but he made sixth place. It wasn't a good day for Ferrari. All their winter success came to naught as Alain Prost could manage no better than the seventh fastest time and teammate Nigel Mansell was way back in 17th. Rain on Saturday meant that Friday's times determined the grid, and this was the view Ricardo Patrese had of proceedings from the sixth row. Head of Imberga made a good start despite a violent swerve into the path of Martini, but the best getaway belonged to Alesi, who screamed from fourth to first before the opening bend, forcing Berger into second place, with Senna and De Cesaris behind. And back in car with Patrese, and Olivier Goyard passes too close in the Acela, and off flies the Williams nose cone.
Alessandro Nanini was also forced to make an early pit stop in his Benetton after an altercation with Schneider's arrows. Five laps into the race and Alessi maintains his surprising lead in the Tyrrell, ahead of the two McLarens of Berger and Senna, with De Cesaris holding on to fourth place in the Dallara. Then came an embarrassing end to Berger's first drive for McLaren. Apparently in no danger, he lost the car at the apex of the bend and slammed into the tyres. Later, the Austrian admitted he'd hit brake and accelerator at the same time. Life in the Ferrari became a little too hot for Prost. He retired with an oil leak from fourth place and skipped out gingerly as the car began to smoke vigorously. Back in the race, Senna and Alessi were providing some brilliant entertainment. The Brazilian made his long-awaited move in textbook fashion, only to watch the apprentice ignore convention and steal it back with a move as daring as it was cheeky. Alessi made himself the darling of the media and the hero of the hour as the two battled like dogfighters, never more than inches apart. And the former world champion eventually gained the upper hand as the pair came upon Gregor Foytex Brabham. Senna then pounced at the same corner, this time remembering to shut the door. But Alesi was in no mood for compromise and doggedly continued to try and repass Senna. The underpowered Tyrrell on its Pirelli tyres proving a match for the mighty McLaren, but eventually Ayrton Senna got the upper hand. Then came one of the most dramatic moments of the race. Nigel Mansell coping brilliantly as his Ferrari's clutch broke, sending the car slewing across the track and out of fifth place. That's where the drama ended. Once in front, Senna is too good a driver to let his advantage slip. He coasted to victory, even pausing to wave to the crowd before the checkered flag. So he claimed nine points, and Jean Lazy was a sensational second for Tyrrell. But it had been a tremendous scrap for the lead, and Alesi had shown true star quality. But Senna had enjoyed one of the best Formula One dices for years. We had a good goal in the first opportunity, and he was very fair. But then I wasn't expecting him going through the outside on the dirty because it would make very dangerous for him the next corner with the dirty on the tires. And when I saw him there, I had just to open and let him go because um, I, I, I expect him with trouble in, with grip with the tires being dirty. And I, I think just as well I did that and we still fight again. It was very exciting. It was enjoyable because I think it was a, a clean fight and uh, exciting one right on the limit. And in those situations is where I, I, got, I get my enjoyment from my profession. From Phoenix to Brazil and the skyscrapers of Sao Paulo's commercial district, which belie the poverty which infests this city. Inflation runs at a thousand percent. In the days before the race, mobs had looted supermarkets. Nevertheless, the Interlagos circuit had been completed in record time and the grandstands would be full of fans willing to spend a month's salary on admission. Almost all of them had one hero in mind when they passed through the turnstiles. Only a Senna victory would take their minds off the problems outside. On the first day of practice, he set out to reward their faith. He unleashed one of his familiar flying laps to take provisional pole position. Although earlier in the day, the local hero proved that he too is human by spinning off into the Sao Paulo mud. Gerhard Berger, still smarting from his embarrassing exit in Phoenix, was the first to take the lap times into the 117s. He had high hopes of two poles in a row. Terry Bootson had been third in America, and although no one could beat the McLaren pair's Friday times, he took third on the grid, but decided the track was tough. It's a very difficult track, because uh, it's got some slow corners, which are followed by fast corners. And these fast corners are all very bumpy, so it means you, have, you are in the middle of this, fast co this faster corner with lots of bumps and you have to change gear in the middle of it, so you can't hold the steering only with one hand, change gear with the other hand and you're shaking left and right in the car with the head going left and right, so it's very tiring for the drivers. I An think. advantage for the Ferrari gearbox perhaps? I would think so, yeah, a big advantage for them here, yeah. But they've got still the reliability problem, so, uh, you know, one of the two, I think the, the driver is still more reliable than the mechanical part of their car, so if we can make our car to finish the race, I think we'll be in good position. Bootson's teammate Ricardo Petrezzi claimed the other place on the second row, and Nigel Mansell recovered from this spin to head up an all-Ferrari third row. The automatic gearbox was proving a boon on this tight and twisting track, but Mansell was already being diplomatic about his new teammate. I don't think it's bad. Uh, um, I still got utmost uh, respect for him as a driver. 
what I will say is, is that uh, perhaps some of the information doesn't come flowing out because basically we're teammates uh, and he's got to try and beat me as I've got to try and beat him. So from that point of view alone, it's probably disappointing. He always wants to know what I'm doing, but very reluctant to tell me what he's doing. The Frenchman had been little more than a tenth of a second slower than his teammate. And another Frenchman eager to follow in his footsteps was right behind him in seventh place. John Alesi heading up the fourth row in the Tyrrell. He was in humble mood when asked about his driving style. I try to be, uh, I try to be the best, but I think uh, I, I need to learn a lot because uh, it's just my uh, first year, my full first year in Formula One. Last year I did uh, eight races, so it's not enough to be a world champion. FISA president Jean-Marie Balestre's role in judging the dispute between Prost and Senna at the end of last season was lampooned by the cartoonists in the crowd. And security around the man himself was formidable as he defied the boos and whistles to walk the pit lane as if there had been nothing controversial about the conclusion of the 1989 championship. The crowd was in better mood as the cars lined up for the start of the race. Hardly surprising as their favourite was at the head of the queue. And he stayed there as the cars raced for the first bend. Teammate Berger riding shotgun as he kept Bootsen at bay. Behind him, De Cesaris must have surprised himself with the speed with which he managed to have a collision, ploughing out of the race as Senna raced into a comfortable lead ahead of Berger and Bootsen. The replay shows a lazy sandwich between Patrese's Williams and the Dallara of De Cesaris, but it was the Italian who found himself launched into the runoff area at high speed. In fact, this was De Cesaris's fastest accident to date, so he was pleased with the record. So Senna led the way, ahead of his teammate, with Boots in third. Crossed fourth for Ferrari, ahead of teammate Mansell, for Tracy fifth and the other Williams, and a Lacey sixth for Tyrrell. But Sandro Nanini had his second first lap altercation in a row. Involved in the De Cesaris incident, he was forced to pit for a new front wing. The onboard cameras gave an impressive view of Bootsen outbreaking Berger to take second place. Bootsen had been impressive in practice at this challenging yet bumpy track, but Berger was clearly still uncomfortable. Then Groyard attempted to cut a corner just as he had two weeks earlier. But this time it was he who came off worse, bouncing off Michele Alboreto's footwork arrows and into the sand trap. Up ahead, Gerhard Berger was about to lose another place. This time, the challenger was world champion Alain Prost. And he passed him with as much ease as Bootsen, beating the Austrian into the bend. Prost was now in third position. His car was behaving itself, and for the first time since leaving McLaren, the Frenchman must have felt in with a chance of winning a race. Then a dramatic demonstration of how not to make a pit stop. Bootsen getting it all wrong for the alarm of at least one of his mechanics. At least he had the presence of mind not to emulate Mansell and engage reverse gear. But it was to be a day for schoolboy mistakes. Senna had time aplenty to overtake back marker Satoru Nakajima, but he chose the wrong moment, and the Tyrrell removed the McLaren's wing. Frantic activity in the pit saw Senna receive a new nose cone, but the replay showed he'd only himself to blame. He lost time and rejoined 27 seconds behind Berger. So arch-rival Alain Prost was in the lead, and it was a stroke of luck he wasn't about to waste. Behind him, Patrese had experienced the other sort of luck. Things had been going well in fifth position when his Williams caught fire, and the Italian had no option but to retire. Prost went on to claim his 40th Grand Prix victory, and his sixth in Brazil, in itself a record. The crowd may have not been too happy, but the Frenchman had recorded his first win for Ferrari. Maybe now he was starting to believe his title could be retained. He won from Berger in second and Senna in third. Teammate Nigel Mansell was fourth with Thierry Boots in fifth and Nelson Piquet sixth. There were emotional scenes in the Ferrari pit after the race as team manager Fiorio congratulated his new driver who couldn't hold back the tears. Honestly, I didn't care about uh, Ayrton today because it was a Brazilian Grand Prix. I just wanted to to do well and uh, wanted to win this race because uh, uh, we expect it to be very competitive uh, at the beginning of the year because we've done very good tests in the winter and the first race was very bad for us and I, I just wanted to push hard from the beginning and I'm very very happy and for me for sure it's my 
maybe my best win in my career. I mean, was the first with Ferrari after only two races, and uh, also for the team it's fantastic because we have a new car, new engine coming in uh, in Imola, and uh, I think it's a good start of the season. On the podium, consolation for Senna from no less than the Brazilian president. Imola Castle, symbol of the old world and of the power vested in the local heroes here, Ferrari. San Marino is the first of the European races and for many the start of the season proper. San Marino attracts some of the biggest crowds in Grand Prix motor racing, most of them Ferrari fanatics, the famed Tifosi. Imola saw the baptism of the new John Barnard-influenced Benetton, the team's main hope of joining the Formula One vanguard. The cameras were on board to witness the Benetton's debut and they caught a less than auspicious first time out for Alessandro Nanini. He emerged unscathed from what was really a large shunt, but he blamed De Cesaris for sending him reeling at Villeneuve corner. Pierluigi Martini was less fortunate in the Minardi. He had a huge accident on Saturday when exiting Aqua Minerale, accelerating out of the chicane and plowing straight into the tyre wall. The Italian braked heavily before impact, but even so, he struck the barrier at speed, and it wasn't clear what had caused the accident. The car was badly damaged in the collision, the chassis absorbing most of the momentum, coming to rest only a few feet from the point of impact. Martini suffered cuts, bruises, and a cracked heel, but his car was broken in two. A day earlier, his teammate Paolo Barilla had suffered a massive spin. Barilla had lost control of the Minardi in spectacular style and only quick reactions from Nigel Mansell ahead prevented a much bigger incident. The Englishman hit the brakes and headed for the gravel as Barilla careered past him out of control. His car had simply accelerated over the grass. Qualifying proved to be an exciting time for Mansell. First he made a couple of unrehearsed excursions onto the rough, trying as hard as ever for the fans. Then he decided to miss out Aqua Minerale altogether, making his Ferrari grass cutter La Macchina Agricoltura. But as usual, he was totally committed. But later he fell foul of Olivier Goyard's Acela, which ruined his flying lap, so the Englishman went wheel to wheel with Goyard to underline his displeasure. Teammate Pras didn't fare much better, spinning right in front of the Tifosi. He finished sixth behind Mansell on the third row. San Marino saw the debut of the Tyrrell's new revolutionary flying front wing. Designer Harvey Postlethwaite said it would make up for the car's shortfall in engine power. There was a new Brabham at Imola too, but the BT-59 was still awaiting its new rear end and gearbox, so it used the old car's back end instead. It looked good enough for David Brabham, signed to the team that carries his father's name for his first race in Formula One. His brother Gary had been replaced in the limping life by Italian veteran Bruno Giacomelli. The change didn't make any difference to the car's pathetic performance and it didn't come close to pre-qualifying. Most of the crowd spent the weekend sleeping on the hills and many bring their own scaffolding to build their own grandstand. The McLarens had beaten the Ferraris to the front row again, but like Prost the season before, was Berger having problems with Senna? Not yet, uh, you know. Uh, if I say we are good friends, we are, have no problems at all, a lot of people will laugh and will say, wait a little bit, it's too early to say this. It's true, we have still a long season in front of us, we uh, work together all the season. Uh, but until now, I just can say he's a nice guy, he's a good friend. 200,000 Italians watched the exciting start to the race and were rewarded with a dramatic San Marino Grand Prix, full of incident and not a little controversy. The drama came quickly as the cars hurtled into the Tamburello curve, scene of Gerhard Berger's horrifying crash the previous year. Mansell ran wide, which led Ivan Capelli's Leighton House to take to the grass, losing control immediately as Nakajima flew off at alarming speed into the guardrail. Martin Donnelly performed a touch-free 360-degree spin, avoiding his rivals who were jockeying for position. Capelli's car was too badly damaged to continue, and the young Italian had no choice but to begin the long walk back to the pit. The onboard camera showed what happened in graphic detail, as Capelli fought through the dust cloud created when Nigel Mansell ran out of track. Satoru Nakajima may have been blinded by the dust. In any case, he collided with Capelli, who'd been forced off the track on the other side. Both cars out of the race for good. 
up ahead, the race continued, and the rejuvenated Nelson Piquet showed all his old verve as he swept past Prost to take seventh position on lap three. As Senna led from Bootsen and Berger, the Formula One apprentice learned a lesson from one of his masters, Mansell, as the Englishman swept past him, remembering to close the door as a lacy tried to regain fifth position almost straight away. But then a moment which the crowd treated with absolute glee as Ayrton Senna, whose McLaren had cracked a rear wheel, went sliding out of the race. Any misfortune for Senna was greeted by pure hysteria from the partisan Italians. But that left Thierry Bootsen out in front ahead of Senna's teammate Berger. Senna was left to climb ignominiously out of his car and work out what went wrong. He checked his wheel to try and ascertain the cause of the damage, oblivious to the derision of the spectators chanting all manner of anti-McLaren spells. Piquet had moved up to fifth place when he found his hands full trying to deal with a man many races and years his junior, Tyrrell's forceful Jean Lazy. The young Frenchman barging past the Brazilian at Tosa. Bootsen's supremacy was short-lived as he was having gearbox problems. First Berger squeezed by into the lead, and then the Belgian had to pull his Williams into the pits to retire. After Berger took the lead, Mansell was working the Tifosi up into another froth as he scorched past Patrese to take second place. But the Englishman reckoned without the mobile chiconery of Andrea De Cesaris in the Dallara. The Italian, who never seems to be able to keep his head still for long enough to use his mirrors, pushed the Brit off the track as Mansell gave him a piece of his mind after the attack. Mansell's next brush was with Berger, who appeared to try to push him off the road, sending Mansell into a spin at 190 miles an hour, which he did brilliantly to control. Mansell's trip over the grass had forced debris into his radiator, and a few laps later, it ended a race he thought had been his. With Prost out of touch with the leaders, the Englishman's demise capped the Tifosi's misery. The replay showed one of the most dramatic incidents of the season so far. Little wonder there were harsh words between Mansell and his former teammate after the race. Meanwhile, Patrese had stolen first place from Berger. The Williams had been performing superbly, and for once, the McLaren didn't have the power to establish supremacy. The battle for third place was proving just as exciting. It seemed anyone's race between Sandro Nanini and Alain Prost. In the end, the Italian won out. So Patrese went on to win only his third Grand Prix in 195 starts. The cheers may not have been as loud as they would have been for a Ferrari win, but the crowd knew the significance of the occasion in any event. In second place, Gerhard Berger, third Nanini for Benetton, and fourth Prost in the one remaining Ferrari. Piquet was fifth, and Alessi sixth. After the race, an ebullient Patrese faced the cameras. Well, I'm very, very pleased. I mean, very happy. I, I don't know what to say. Really, I wanted to win this Grand Prix because uh, I had uh, something uh, since uh, 1983 when I lost uh, with the Brabham. Uh, four laps to go crashing at the Aqua Minerale. So this, this year was the next time I had the chance to be competitive and win. So I tried all my best and my car really was super perfect since the beginning to the end. And uh, everything went straight through without any problem. Very good, thank you. The expense of Formula One cars is almost matched by the cost of the boats bobbing elegantly in the harbor at Monte Carlo. The Monaco Grand Prix is the most glamorous on the circuit. It may not be a favorite among drivers or enthusiasts, but as an event, the weekend is unrivaled, top of the jet sets list. The crowd reflects true fans and a more glamorous following in almost equal numbers. It's not far for the president of FISA to come either. Ricardo Patrese is in more of a hurry, but his boss is happy to talk about the magic of Monaco. For me, it's a great pleasure to come here for the mechanics of the race team. It's very hard work but I know they enjoy it too. And you must remember that we are 
we're part of show business in a way. It's, it's sport and it's business. And we, we are here to perform on the track and off it. And the fact that so many people turn up to watch us, I think is, is truly glorious. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it different. And I'm very happy to race here. Back on the track, Petrese used a selection of Williams to go fast enough to take fourth position on the grid. Amazingly, this was Jean Lazy's Formula One debut at Monaco. He'd never raced here before, but simply scorched round to take third place. But was Ken Tyrrell's team at a disadvantage here? Well, certainly it's the sort of track where the, the power advantage of the, of the three top teams is, well, is not so effective for them. It's a, it's a circuit where you need a, a light, nimble car with a driver who's prepared to go for it. So uh, we should do better here than we've done in the last two races. We'd be happy for him to finish in, in fifth or sixth in every Grand Prix this year, just getting the experience ready for when he gets the Honda engine next year. But um, he's not really like that. He's, he's in, in many ways, he's like Senna. He has to go for it. Alain Prost is perhaps a lazy's biggest hero, and little Napoleon showed how good he is with second place. Ayrton Senna is a resident of Monaco, perhaps that's why he's so popular with the crowd. He responded to their encouragement by taking yet another pole position. The onboard camera, this time there are two of them, gives a superb insight to the man's talent, his lightning reactions keeping a small amount of air between his wheels and the hard armco barrier lining this tough street circuit. Were it not for this altercation with Foytek, then Senna's flyer might have been even quicker. Race day dawned overcast but dry, which was a relief for the drivers after the storm which had marred Saturday's Formula 3 race. With a three-day build-up instead of two, perhaps the excitement of the green light after so long made a first lap accident inevitable. The 48th Monaco Grand Prix was barely 30 seconds old when it came to a temporary halt. A Lacey sneaking inside Frost Ferrari and Gerhard Berger trying and failing to do the same. Monaco is the narrowest of circuits, as the view from Alessandro Nanini's Benetton confirms. It doesn't take much to block the track, and a restart was inevitable. Ivan Capelli was the first to abandon his defunct Leighton house and run back down the hill towards the spare car. Berger followed his example. But Alan Prost isn't called the professor for nothing. He spotted an official car doing nothing and couched a lift. Yes, Matthew, very smart indeed, but not as clever as our onboard camera team, who had rigged another camera into Berger's T-car. Start number two, and this time Senna managed to hightail it away, with Prost hanging on to his second place, heaping the other 24 members of the Bane pack behind him all the way up the hill. This time Prost kept a tight line going into Mirabeau, Keeping a lazy in third place, Gerhard Berger was fourth, Patrese fifth, and Mansell sixth. While Senna streamed away at the front, teammate Berger was busy coping with the heavy traffic on the Monaco streets, trying to challenge a lazy in the confined space. Mansell showed how hard passing is here when he tried to get by Boots and at the chicane. The cars touched, damaging the Ferrari's nose cone, and Mansell was forced to make a premature visit to the pits. Overtaking problems affect the leader too, as Senna discovered when he tried to get past backmarker Satoru Nakajima in the Tyrrell. But his difficulties were nothing to those suffered by second-placed Prost. The world champion was forced into the pits and out of the race with a faulty battery. Nelson Piquet was desperate to rob Boots in a fifth place. And he was to fall another victim of Monaco's tortuously narrow track. He pushed just a little too hard at the Lowe's hairpin and lost control of his Benetton. Bootsen drove cheerfully on, leaving the three-time world champion to suffer the further embarrassment of stalling when he tried to find reverse. Then he accepted a push from the stewards, for which he was soon afterwards disqualified. Mansell squeezed past Derek Warwick's Lotus as the pair exited the chicane to take fifth place. And then he managed to rob Bootsen of fourth position at the entrance to the chicane. This time he completed the manoeuvre without losing a nose cone. The battle for fourth and fifth was only one of two to keep the Monegasque crowd entertained. Coming up to lap them, Alessi was fighting a desperate battle to maintain his second place ahead of an impatient Gerhard Berger. The Austrian still looking for his first win for McLaren. 
It was all getting a little frantic as the drivers fought for extra space on this narrowest of tracks. Mansell's battle was about to come to an unsatisfactory end. He was forced to retire on the 64th lap, another Ferrari with battery problems. Despite the heat of battle, Alesi was driving superbly, soaking up every threat from third place Berger. Finding his street rhythm very fast indeed, Alesi then started to reel in Senna. It became an enthralling charge and Senna's lead suddenly looked more vulnerable. For some reason, the Brazilian appeared to be slowing despite the young pretender's chase. And it looked more than close at the end, but yet Ayrton Senna just hung on to take his third ever Monte Carlo Grand Prix win. So in an exciting finish, Ayrton Senna just edged out Elaze. Gerhard Berger was third and Boots and fourth, with some welcome points for Alex Caffey, fifth for Footwork Arrows, and Eric Bernard sixth in the LaRousse. Senna, used to Monaco protocol, took his heavy prize from Prince Rainier, whilst the new French courtier, Alesi, simply shook everyone's hand all the way along the line to make sure he got it right. A quarter of the way through the season, and Ayrton Senna leads the Drivers' Championship, six points ahead of Berger, with Alesi third and Prost fourth. In the Constructors' Championship, McLaren have more than twice as many points as second place Williams, with Ferrari third and Tyrrell a proud four. Back across the Atlantic now to the home of Expo 67 Trade Fair and the Canadian Grand Prix on the Ile de Notre Dame near Montreal. Ayrton Senna, hardly surprisingly, was the quickest man on the circuit in Friday's qualifying session. He took half a second off his pole winning time last year. Even so, his future with the team is still in doubt as his contract is up for renewal this year. Since this year is my last season with McLaren Honda under contract, I have an uh, open situation as far as my future is concerned. I have enjoyed a lot of success here and I, I, I recognize that very highly. But my objective is to be where there is the best chance for winning, being a combination of chassis and engine. And uh, as I fortunately enough have an open door and anything, I am uh, finding out what are the possibilities and the chance and the perspectives in different teams uh, in order to evaluate better and make the right decision when it comes to make the, right, the decision. Senna's teammate Gerhard Berger was second fastest on Saturday, but he's unlikely to dislodge the Brazilian come race day, not if he continues to make mistakes like this one at the hairpin. Perhaps he'll blame it on the cramped conditions in the McLaren cockpit. Senna's greatest rival, Alain Prost, was third fastest in the Ferrari. There were just two minutes of the hour left when the world champion unleashed some of the car's long-awaited potential. Nelson Piquet, who first raced here in 1978 for Brabham, was fifth quickest in the official practice. His Benetton teammate, Alessandro Nanini, went one better in the afternoon, joining Prost on the provisional second row. Terry Bootsom was a winner in Canada in 1989 and was in contention again in 1990 with six fastest time after the first session. But Montreal will always be a special track for him as he broke his Grand Prix duck here. Well, it was, I mean, the first one is always very, very important, but uh, I got to victory a bit like a present because Senna dropped out two minutes before the end. I mean, of course, he had a problem with the car and the thing is that you have to finish the race to win it. And I was there. But it was quite a good race because at one stage I was uh, due to my ch tire change. I was one minute 45 behind, and I fought back and um, you know been trying very very hard to, to to come back into the the lead. And when Senna stopped, I was less than 15 seconds behind him. So I think it was quite a good race for me. And uh, he had to push hard, I had to push hard, and I won the race. I was very happy about it. Canada has a reputation for rain, and the second day's qualifying was ruined by the weather. No one had a chance to improve their times, which meant Mauricio Gugerman didn't qualify, although teammate Ivan Capelli did. Uh, we know what our problems are. It's just basically to make new parts. It takes a long time, and until we go back to the European races, I don't think we can do it. Rain persisted for the morning of race day. The crowds filled the grandstands despite the weather, although raincoats and umbrellas were the order of the day. The track had started to dry come 2 o'clock, making tyre selection difficult. 
Gerhard Berger's eagerness got the better of him. He jumped the start for which he was later penalised a full minute. No one else tried an impetuous move as the cars drew away. The front two followed by Nanini and Prost. Then Jean Lazy followed closely by Nelson Piquet. Bootsen for Williams and then Mansell. But Pierluigi Martini's race in the Minardi came to an early end as he spun out. Although no such misfortune for Senna who had a comfortable lead over Berger who'd been docked a minute. Nanini and Alesi were both making light of the awkward wet and dry conditions. Senna was finding the track more dry than wet before too long, so he gambled on a pit stop to switch from wet to slick tyres. Despite the skill of the McLaren pit crew, they were never going to complete the change before Nanini cleared the pit lane exit to take the lead. Peloton driver was looking for his first win since Japan last year. Once out again, Senna had no objection to letting his teammate pass. After all, Gerhard was a full minute behind thanks to the stewards. But the young Italian's advantage wasn't to last long. He'd fallen foul of a gopher on the track. The result, a flat tyre and a damaged front wing. In the melee behind him, John Alessi had been in the wars too, colliding with Bootsen, and he needed a new nose cone. Since his wins in the rain here and in Adelaide, Thierry Bootsen had gained a reputation as a rainmaster. But it was a rookie's mistake which saw him spin past Prost as he tried to overtake off the line, and then he collided with the innocent Nicola Larini. Nannini then fell foul of a wet spot on the track. The result, one very mangled Benetton in the tyre wall. But much worse was to befall Jean Alesi as he joined the Montreal stunt team. He completely lost control of the Tyrrell on the treacherous surface and helplessly slithered towards the same tyre wall that Nannini's Benetton was enmeshed in. Alesi then used the Benetton as a ladder to his perch on the top of the tyre pile. The Benetton B190 Ford was written off leaving the team's mechanics with a massive rebuild to perform before Mexico. Meanwhile, Nelson Piquet had been battling hard with Prost for second place. His persistence paid off, and on lap 49, he got the better of the Frenchman. Prost's problems didn't end there because his teammate Mansell was on the way with one of his characteristic charges. The champion's fears were realised soon afterwards as Mansell got the better of him and set off in pursuit of Piquet. But none of this affected the man in front. It had been another textbook drive from Senna and another valuable win in his bid to regain the title he thought had been stolen from him the year before. So Senna the winner from Piquet in the Benetton and third Mansell for Ferrari. Gerhard Berger was fourth despite his one-minute penalty, Alain Prost fifth and Derek Warwick sixth for Lotus. Yeah, I think uh, <coughs> it was difficult for everybody. The conditions were just um, quite slippery to start with, with wet tires, and then when we changed to slick tires, the circuit is not completely dry, and you must stay on the line because it's. If you go a little bit off line, you have a problem. To overtake other cars, you have also a big problem because you must stay on line. It was very dirty off line, so it was a very tough race for everybody. I'm sure. From the moisture of Montreal to the heat and dust of Mexico. Although the heat on the first day of practice made a welcome change from what had gone before. It had poured throughout Thursday afternoon and night. The sun was back and only just in time for the early brigade. In fact, the track was still damp for the pre-qualifiers as Aguri Suzuki discovered to his cost as he went off line whilst trying to warm up his tyres, having just changed to slicks. Belarus span into the tyre wall at around 135 miles an hour, but the Japanese driver managed to jog back to the pits unharmed and qualify with the spare car in fourth and last place on the last lap of the session. In fact, it was going to be a busy weekend for the LaRousse mechanics. Eric Bernard doubled their workload when he crashed heavily at Peralta during Saturday's untimed session. The pit crew performed a mammoth task in getting the car ready for the afternoon session, but the Frenchman could manage no better than 25th. Even so, like his teammate Suzuki, Bernard could be thankful that the only damage was suffered by the cars. Both men had experienced alarming high-speed accidents without injury due to the strength of the Lola chassis and the good safety facilities at the circuit Humanes Rodriguez. For the first time since the opening race of the season, pole position went to Austria's Gerhard Berger. This was the sixth pole position of his career, and he did it on Friday, unable to beat himself the next day. The car wasn't bad, I had a clear lap, I had no traffic, so like usual if you are quickest it, uh, it went right. How are you coping with all the bumps? Difficult. Physically on you? Alright, 
I mean, you feel the air here. You feel the thin air in the engine and in yourself. But everybody have the same problem. Third fastest on Friday, Ricardo Patrese got it together on his second set of qualifiers on Saturday to take second fastest. The bumps that Gerhard Berger have been talking about are all too obvious from the camera on board Senna's car. The Brazilian could do no better than third fastest, a lowly position for him, but he still found time to celebrate as the McLaren chef had baked a cake to celebrate his 100th Grand Prix. Senna took great care in carving himself out a slice and then showed slightly less respect as he plastered team manager Joe Ramirez, the Mexican member of the McLaren team. Back on the track, Nigel Mansell proved his mastery of opposite lock to take fourth position on Saturday. But Alain Prost had a nightmare, finishing 13th fastest, his lowest grid position since 1980. As the cars lined up for the off, Leighton House were notable by their absence. Neither car had qualified. As the lights flashed from red to green, it was Patrese who made the perfect start, removing Berger's advantage. Perhaps Gerhard was being extra careful after his mishap in Montreal. It was Senna's McLaren which chased Patrese into turn one, leaving Berger to tuck himself in behind. Senna really tried everywhere to get past, stalking Patrese all the way through the sweeping turns behind the grandstand, coming close to overtaking at least once, but denied at the last minute by a sudden change of direction from the Williams. So as the first lap drew to a close, Patrese led from Senna with Berger third, followed by Bootson, Piquet, Mansell, Alesi, Warwick, Martini and Donnelly. Still, Senna was desperately close to taking the lead, this time taking the outside line. But again, Patrese refused to give way. The Brazilian pulled alongside as the cars entered the finish straight, and there was nothing between them as they crossed the start line. But the McLaren's greater power could not be denied any longer, and Senna eased past the Williams before the first corner, and Berger had time to follow suit. The two McLarens soon established a healthy lead, and then Nelson Piquet and Thierry Bootsen found a way past Patrese as well. Further behind, Prost had fought his way up through the field to challenge Derek Warwick for ninth position, but Berger had blistered his left front tyre early on and stopped prematurely for fresh rubber on lap 13. Pit crew were as efficient as ever, although Berger did his best to leave most of his new rubber on the pit road as he made his departure. Piquet had inherited second place after Berger's stop, but he wasn't to hold it for long. He fell victim to another of Mansell's cavalry charges. Using all of his newfound grip, Berger was fighting back. He screamed past Patrese to take eighth place. Then it was Piquet's turn to make a tyre stop, and it meant Prost gained third position. The Frenchman was really going for it now. It had been an incredible performance to come from 13th position on the grid. Soon he went from third to second as Mansell found himself trapped by a back marker. Meantime, Senna had been slowing down with a tyre problem, a slow puncture. He had gambled on not returning to the pits, but he couldn't hold off the oncoming Frenchman. Prost took the lead in a classic manoeuvre and his bitterest rival could only sit and watch. Then came the moment Senna had gambled against. His tyre disintegrated and he had to coast back to the pits. But his teammate was still alive and kicking. Berger bursting past Mansell on the inside to claim second place. But Mansell was in fighting mood and made one of the bravest outside overtaking manoeuvres I've ever seen at a very dangerous corner to regain his second place. Berger's camera showing just how fast Mansell really went. So Prost recorded his second victory of the season and his second for Ferrari. It had come at the right time, just as the pundits were predicting another season of McLaren dominance. Second was Mansell making it a Ferrari 1-2. Afterwards, Prost was tired but happy. Uh, after this uh, morning warm-up, uh, I expected to do a good race because uh, I felt that the car was uh, quite good, but I couldn't expect to win the race and uh, it was really fantastic for me. The podium celebrations were as vigorous as we'd seen all year. For Berger and Mansell, a safer fight than we'd witnessed out on the track. Yeah, I mean, basically, I think we were side by side. And I'd made my mind up that I was just going to go in there flat. And uh, that's exactly what I did. And fortunately, Gerhard lifted. I had to lift off because it was too dangerous if we would pro go both flat out in the corner. And then was again close in the last lap because uh, there was another car slow in front of Nigel. 
and I saw, okay, now I will try again. But uh, the car moved a little bit inside, and I wasn't sure he saw me or not, so it was too dangerous to stay flat out. So I lift a little bit too, and it was not enough. The boats bobbing gently in the harbour at Bandol, a few miles below Le Castellet, offer the perfect contrast to the noise and aggression that surrounds qualifying for the French Grand Prix. Still, there are plenty of punters, millionaires or otherwise, willing to forsake the seaside to see the Formula One circus in action. On board with Riccardo Patrese on the new surface at Paul Ricard for the last time before the event moves to Magnicor, but Patrese could only manage sixth place, and his Williams teammate Thierry Bootsen punctured and spun, the Belgian qualifying no better than eighth. This was bitterly disappointing, not just for Williams, but of course for the might of Renault, who were here on home ground. In the Ferrari pit, Jean-Marie Belles gives Nigel Mansell the benefit of his opinions. Obviously, the discussion was a private, if one-sided one, but it must have had some effect on Mansell. He went on to take pole for Ferrari, their 108th, a Formula One record. Despite claiming that he hates this circuit, Gerhard Berger was second fastest. Overnight work on his McLaren saw his speed improve significantly from Friday to Saturday. Teammate Ayrton Senna was third. He would still be dangerous from the second row. And the man looking for his third win of the year would be alongside Senna come race day. Alain was feeling confident about another home win. I think so. I think so. I have a very good chance. The car is quite good. We are also very good in qualifying. And uh, about the same than, than Mexico than the previous races, I'm much stronger with the rest tires. But uh, it doesn't matter if I start in first row or second row, we we'll be OK. The, the car now is quite reliable, so I'm very optimistic. Ivan Capelli was seventh quickest, Leighton House using new aerodynamics designed by Adrian Newey before his departure. Teammate Mauricio Guzelman was tenth on the grid. The French sun maintained the glare we'd reddened under all weekend for the start, which was more like something seen at Santa Pod than in Formula One as Mansell and Berger drag race for first place into the first bend. But it was Mansell who kept the best line, tearing into the corner with Berger in extremely close attendance, but then Thierry Bootsen is nudged from behind by Capelli. Another new angle from the boys in the onboard camera department. This time we see how the pack are faring behind Bernard's LaRousse. But Berger had found a way past Mansell in the curves at the back of the circuit. The Austrian swept on to improve his lead while his teammate began to harry the Englishman. As the pack streamed into the first bend for the second time, Senna made his move and caught Mansell at the same place Berger had done on lap one. The sheer power of the Honda engine was now starting to figure. But the French Grand Prix was not a happy one for Thierry Bootsen because he was out on lap eight with a broken engine. John Alesi didn't enjoy the day either, out with a broken differential. Prost decided to stop for tyres on lap 26. The decision cost him a drop from 6th to 8th place, but it was a calculated gamble. While Prost was in the pits, Senna was out on the track, taking the lead. Berger took the hint and came into the pits for some fresh grip. Two laps later, Senna followed his teammate's example. On the next lap, the Ferrari mechanics had a chance to get their hands dirty as Mansell pitted. Back in the race, neither Patrese in the Williams or Capelli in the Leighton House had come into the pits, and as a result, they were in first and second place. Capelli, reveling in the new design, then took the lead. Patrese decided it was time for a stop, but it was a bad one. He rejoined the race in 10th position. The Leighton House team could hardly believe their eyes. Non-qualifiers in the last race, now they were first and second, with Cross third and Nanini fourth. For Capelli, it was a brilliant day. He held the lead for a total of 45 laps, longer than anyone in the race. Behind him, his teammate Guzman had surrendered second place to the local hero. While Capelli carried on strongly out front, his Brazilian teammate Guzman's luck deserted him just four laps later when he was forced out of the race with engine failure. Same problems put pay to Mansell's hopes of making it another Ferrari 1-2. The Englishman dropped out seven laps from the finish. Now it was a desperate chase to the flag for Capelli. Could he hold off the Frenchman? 
The Italian performed miracles until just three laps from the finish when a stuttering engine gave the world champion the break he needed. So Prost was on his way to the nine points and Ferrari's 100th win in Grand Prix motor racing. It was a day worth celebrating. Even the man himself couldn't have predicted this success before the start of the season. The French crowd made themselves heard above the roar of the Ferrari, but perhaps the biggest party was held in the Leighton House pit. In a dramatic reversal of fortunes, Capelli had come from the doldrums to equal his highest ever finish, having finished second in Japan two years previously. But could he have held on for the win? Then uh, at the end, unfortunately, when I was in front of uh, Prost, I had some problem with the oil lights of the engine. And so I, in the last two laps, the engine started to, to have problems. And uh, I, I'm actually, I'm lucky to finish second. Without that, do you think you could have stayed ahead? Actually, when uh, Prost was behind me and he attacked me, I was actually make a big, a good reaction because we were together, but he couldn't overtake me. So it's just a matter of, uh, of power that uh, didn't uh, stay until the end. Is this a turnaround we can expect to see for the rest of the season? <laughs> I would like, yes. I mean, after Mexico, not qualified here, here in, in second place. Yes, I would like to come here again uh, next week in Silverstone. Maybe Leighton House rewarded Ivan with a trip in the company jet. In any event, there was precious little time to waste between Le Castellet and Silverstone, the French and the British races just a week apart. This the last time the drivers would race around the old circuit before changes are made to the track. As always at the British race, there's only one hero. Mansell celebrated his home Grand Prix with pole position, roaring around Silverstone in the fastest time ever set by a Formula One car. Transport off the track for him and golfing friend Greg Norman was a little more sedate. McLaren chose a mode of transport more in keeping with their image as the sport's top team. Ayrton Senna and Gerhard Berger, second and third on the grid respectively, arrived each day by helicopter. The British event is a home Grand Prix for Williams too, and Thierry Bootsen kept them in touch with fourth place on the grid. But it was a more Italian celebration for his teammate Riccardo Patrese, who celebrated his 200th race with fifth on the grid. Michele Alboreto and Alessandro Nanini tried to dampen the proceedings while Patrese gave his thoughts on the new proposed Silverstone. Well, I have to say that uh, it's a bit of, it's a shame that uh, uh, Silverstone in this configuration go away because it's one of the uh, oldest circuit and uh, yes, a, a special feeling with the driver, I think, because of all these quick corners, so flat. Uh, I mean, it. it it is a challenge to drive in Silverstone, as it is now, but I uh, don't have any doubt that uh, if they change the circuit, they're going to do a very good job. Chairman Tom Walkinshaw had previously announced £2 million worth of dramatic changes in elevation and contour to be made to Silverstone before 91. With Silverstone bedecked in Ferrari flags and looking more like Monza than Northamptonshire, Mansell must have been desperate to reach Cops first. Instead, he seemed to settle for trying to run Senna off the road. But the Brazilian won the first battle, leaving Mansell to follow in second, then Berger, Prost, Bootsen and Alessi. This the view from Bernard's LaRousse as both Lotuses try to get past. But Senna was never able to establish a commanding lead, with Mansell always looming large in his mirrors. The cheers of the crowd outdid the roar of the engines as the Englishman overtook the former world champion on lap nine. But the applause subsided as Senna reversed the move in an instant. Two laps later, Mansell tried again, and this time he got it right going under the bridge, sending the crowd into another great roar. But Ayrton Senna's discomfiture was complete on lap 14. He ran over the curb at Cops and span across the road and into the grass. He kept the engine running, but by the time he rejoined the race, he was back in fifth position. Meanwhile, Alain Prost made it Ferrari's one and three as he got the better of Bootsen in another daring manoeuvre by the Frenchman. And on lap 15, Alessandro Nanini nudged countryman Riccardo Patrese from behind. Nanini retired, and then Patrese retired after a trip to the pits revealed that his under tray was smashed. Senna decided to take on fresh rubber. The new set of Bs cost him a drop to 10th place. Up ahead, Mansell was having trouble with his automatic gearbox, which had decided to start changing gears of its own accord. The malfunction gave Berger the chance to grab the lead. 
but the errant gearbox appeared to mend itself. Six laps later, Mansell outbraked the Austrian at the chicane and was back in front. Perhaps inspired by his teammate's example, Prost took the chance to pick off Berger too. But British fans could have done without the professor's next manoeuvre. Team orders stated the Ferrari should maintain their positions. But with Mansell's gearbox still misbehaving, Prost reckoned he had no option but to take the lead. It was a sad moment for the crowd's favourite, but nothing like as miserable as what came next. Mansell slowed suddenly at the end of the pit straight as he began lap 56, all gears gone, and with them, his hopes of a win in the race he relishes most. Back with the action, Nelson Piquet demonstrated that even the most experienced driver can get things wrong. At least he kept the engine alive and got back in the swing, but Senna was too close to resist taking fourth spot. Worse luck for his teammate Berger, who retired four laps from home with a broken throttle mechanism. But Eric Bernard was enjoying one of his best ever races for LaRousse. He unlapped himself despite blistered tyres and slipped past Piquet to take fourth place. Confirmation, if any were needed, that the team wouldn't need to pre-qualify in future. The closing laps had been uneventful for Prost. He cruised to his first ever hat-trick of wins and his 43rd career victory. So Prost was the winner for Ferrari, playing his usual calculated game ahead of Thierry Bootsen, who'd crept up almost unnoticed to take second. Senna was third on a bad day for McLaren, with Bernard fourth, Nelson Piquet fifth, and Suzuki sixth. But the headlines were stolen by Mansell, who shocked everyone in Formula One with the announcement that he was to retire at the end of the season to spend more time with his wife and family. He'd experienced a bad weekend, plagued by mechanical misfortune, and he'd simply had enough. I'm sorry. I've, uh, I'm announcing my retirement, and uh, I'm looking forward to racing 100% to the end of the year. Um, I'm very thrilled for Ferrari that uh, they've managed to do what they've done. And if I can help Alan win the championship, and if I can win some races before the end of the year myself, great. But uh, I'm looking forward to putting my family first for the first time ever in my life. And um, really, uh, I've got nothing more to say except uh, uh, thank one and all. And I look forward to the next eight races. But uh, I can tell you, as of this minute, uh, Adelaide will be my last Grand Prix. What about the surprise announcement from Nigel Mansell just a few minutes ago? Uh, that is uh, that is uh, the problem of the day for me. I'm not very happy because it's it's a shame for for us I and mean, for drive for the team for for the drivers. A guy like Nigel is always very competitive, and uh, I'm I must uh, say that uh, in this kind of situation you must um, uh, accept and uh, respect the decision because it's for, it must be very difficult for him to take this decision. It will be difficult to finish the season with us. And uh, I know that Nigel is, um, is a good man and uh, he will help the team and, and myself, I'm sure, until the end. Uh, it's a shame. We will regret him next year for sure. At the halfway mark in the season, Prost was ahead of Senna by two points, whereas most had expected his Ferrari to be chasing Ayrton Senna's McLaren from second. Third place Berger surprised the experts by not winning in a McLaren thus far, whereas Piquet's progress in fourth was pleasing. In the Constructors' Championship, however, McLaren were at a 10-point advantage over Ferrari, and no one else was really getting a look in. There was no mistaking the location of the next race, the biggest German flag in Christendom heralding the team's arrival in Hockenheim. Smaller pennants for the rest of the world, but no doubt about the colours being sported in the grandstands. Ferrari red, the order of the day. New pressure for Philip Alio and the Ligier team. A points reckoning at this, the halfway point in the season, had left them relegated to the ranks of the pre-qualifiers, with LaRousse promoted in their place. Coloni were sporting their new Ford engine for the first time. As Bertrand Gasho tried to explain, the car crashed at the first bend, sustained damage to the rear, and the persistent Belgian failed to pre-qualify yet again. Alessandro Nanini was using the new Series 4 Ford HB engine in his Benetton, but he crashed at the third chicane during Friday's session, and the car was completely destroyed after a dramatic flash fire, but Nanini was still ninth on the grid, and he was optimistic afterwards. 
to win. We, I think we can also win because maybe the other, uh, the other car has a problem for the fuel consumption in this circuit. I think we are faster for the race and uh, we can arrive on the first three positions sure. Jean Lazy had come to grief on Friday afternoon as well. The Tyrrell blowing up in spectacular fashion as he tried to record his second flyer of the day. Many thought his preoccupation with matters outside the car were beginning to affect his performance inside it. Nelson Piquet might have improved on seventh position on the grid, but he was still progressing the car's settings and the new engine. Jerry Bootson's sixth place in the Williams was a triumph over adversity, a blown engine and traffic interfering with his qualifying times. Ricardo Patrese improved from ninth fastest on Friday to fifth the following day, whilst Nigel Mansell told Martin Brundle how he might have improved upon fourth position were it not for a massive spin on Saturday, when he did well to avoid meeting with the barriers and pirouetted across the grass. Despite having two cars at his disposal, Alain Prost managed no better than third fastest after problems with gear settings. No worries for the McLaren pairing. Happy that their Friday times couldn't be touched, they spent the whole of Saturday preparing their race setup, with Berger second and Senna in his customary pole position. Honda had supplied a new high revving engine, and it was clear to everyone in the pit lane that it would be back to business as usual for McLaren in Germany. Packed grandstands awaited the start as the humidity reached saturation point. The parade lap completed, the cars lined up on the grid, with the leading players arranged neatly in rows, McLaren, Ferrari and Williams. With the green light, Berger tried desperately to separate Senna from the lead, going into the first corner as mayhem broke out at the back of the grid with a wheel flying perilously close to drivers' heads. The rest of the field held grid positions and formed a high-speed orderly German convoy out of the stadium section. But not everyone was following. There was chaos at the back of the grid when Piro's Delara climbed over Brabham's Brabham and span in front of Philippe Alio's Ligier. Piro had been knocked out as his car connected with the pit wall. Up ahead, Senna led from Berger, Prost, Mansell, Patrese, Piquet, Nanini, Alessi, Capelli and Bootsen. Bootsen was in fact dropping back with a gearbox problem, but Nelson Piquet was really trying hard in the early laps, pushing Patrese hard, when our camera on board the Brazilian's car caught him overshooting the first chicane. He overshot, had to wait for a car park attendant to move the cone before rejoining, dropping him to seventh place, but we didn't think he could do that under the new rules. He wasn't the only one to be caught out by the chicanes, however. Prost uncharacteristically went curb hopping, and then Nigel Mansell went on so far at the Oss curve, damaging the Ferrari's under tray in the process. The Englishman rejoined the track carefully as he tried to assess the damage, but Berger had found his car overheating in Senna's slipstream. He was the first to stop the tyres, and the delay dropped him from second to fifth. Cross stopped early for tyres too, but it wasn't the Ferrari pit crew's best effort and cost him a fall from third to seventh place in the order. Shortly afterwards, Mansell limped home, the trip across the grass having proved fatal. Senna was the last of the front runners to take on fresh rubber. The McLaren pit crew showed their colleagues at Ferrari the way to go, another sub seven second stop. And when Senna rejoined the race, he was milliseconds away from keeping his lead. But Nanini's momentum was too much to cope with and the Benetton was in front. Sensationally, after such a bad start to his German weekend, Nanini was flying with Ford's new engine giving great top-end power on this circuit of two straights connected by chicanes and two major bends. But somehow, Alessandro kept Senna at bay, his Benetton clearly on the limit, not just on traction but tyre wear too, with Grand Prix veteran Riccardo Patrese again impressing in third place. John Lazy further demonstrated his agitated and uneasy mood as he dramatically missed his pit and he had to go round again. Piquet had moved up to third after Patrese had pitted for fresh rubber, but this wasn't to last long. An awful silence heralded a blown engine for the Benetton and third place for Berger. Prost had been suffering with his engine persistently hitting the rev limiter and it was as much as he could do to rob Bootsen of fourth place despite the presence of a yellow flag. Meanwhile, the cat and mouse game at the front of the race was coming to an end. Nanini had performed brilliantly on his single set of tyres, but no one believed he could hold back the McLaren, complete with new rubber, forever. Senna made his move on lap 34, and the Italian had nothing by way of response. 
The way was clear for the Brazilian to move smoothly towards his 24th Grand Prix victory. He had stopped the rot begun by Prost in Mexico and scored an important win for McLaren. The doubters would have to eat their words. It was Senna's fourth win of the year, and it meant the championship race was back on with a vengeance. An excellent second place for Nanini, with Berger third, Alain Prost fourth, Patrese fifth, and Bootsen sixth. Uh, when I get out of the pits, Nanini just passed by, just managed to go through. I had some difficult for a couple of laps with the pressure, so I wait. But then when I tried to push, I had some problem with the engine, and the engine lost some power. So I, I tried just to go through, but I realized I couldn't do it. So I, I decided to back off and give some time, think about, refresh the tires again, because being behind was too hard on the tires, and wait for later race. I realized he had not stopped for tires, so for sure later in the race he would have more problem because his tires would be worn out while I had the new fresh, new fresh tires. So it worked good. Towards the end he started to have more difficulties with grip and I was able to be more stronger to come closer and uh, I managed to get a very good toe and then overtake him. So to the banks of the majestic Danube and the beautiful old city of Budapest and the first Hungarian Grand Prix since the Iron Curtain was torn apart. Still one of the most popular races on the calendar. Hungary is the closest circuit to Austria and the Von Trapp family turned up in force to support their hero Berger who responded by setting Friday's fastest time. But his claims for pole were denied by Thierry Bootsen who used a special Renault engine to put the Williams at the top of the list. Afterwards Bootsen described the tight Hungara ring. Well it's a very demanding circuit, lots of corners, very tiring. It's always very, very warm, so it's pretty hard on the drivers, and that's uh, something I mean, the driver with the, the best physical condition is always uh, in a good place here. Your teammate is alongside you on the front row. What are your hopes for the race? Well, I will try to do all I can to win the race, for sure. Starting from pole position is not bad, so I will do the best I can to stay there. Patrese was second, but Berger's hopes of hanging on to his advantage disappeared as he braked too late at the chicane and went bouncing across the grass. As if to justify his teammates' misdeeds and the chassis shortcomings, Senna managed to do exactly the same thing a little later. McLaren boss Ron Dennis must have had a few words to say as his cars were reduced to the second row. Nigel Mansell seemed happy enough with fifth place as he explained to team boss Cesare Fiorio and big boss Gianni Agnelli. Jean Alessi would be alongside him on the third row. Rumours over his future had reached fever pitch of the Hangara ring. The offers from Ferrari and Williams were well documented. But the young Frenchman had been alluding to an option for McLaren. Not so, said Tyrrell. Yes, I'm sure that Jean Alessi will be driving for me next year. In the words of uh, President Bush, watch my lips. Other silly season stories centred on Nigel Mansell's replacement. Would it be Brabham, Stefano Modena? And Leighton House's Ivan Capelli had been open about his talks with the Ferrari bosses. Meanwhile, Camel announced a switch of sponsorship from Lotus to Benetton and Williams next year, with most of the money going to the former. Presumably the United Colours would be mostly yellow next season. The good weather held up for the start of the race, and there was a genuine air of expectancy as two o'clock approached. Bootsen made the best of his advantage, but a surge of Honda power saw Berger split the Williams duo before the first bend. He tried to go one better, but Bootsen gave him short shrift, chopping across the apex and holding his place. But Senna had a torrid start, losing two places, the first as Mansell took the outside line, and the second as a lazy nip through on the inside. So Bootsen led them out to the back of the circuit with Berger second, Patrese third, Mansell fourth, followed by a lazy Senna Nanini in the first of the Benettons, the Cesaris doing well for Dallara, then PK and Prost in a lowly ten. Satoru Nakajima was an early casualty in the Tyrrell, losing it on lap 15 and then adding insult to injury by flicking the car into the tyre wall and retiring. His teammate Alesi was soon to suffer some misfortune as Senna gained revenge for his opening manoeuvre. And a lap later, disaster for the Brazilian, a stone in the wheel rim meant an unexpected pit stop and he rejoined in 10th place after this visit to the pits. But disaster for Prost, he span out on lap 37 when his gearbox seized. 
The race came to an early end for a Lacey too. He was trying to lap Martini when the Italian stupidly tried to resist. The two collided and both were out of the running. Senna was up to sixth. Berger gave up trying to overtake Bootsen on old rubber. He came into the pits on lap 48 and dropped from second to sixth place in the process. Five laps later, Nanini confirmed the efficiency of the Benetton as he outsprinted Mansell on the main straight, despite a wild swing from the Englishman, which might have left him embedded in the pit wall. Alessandro Nanini using all the momentum from that newfound power with the Ford engine slipping inside Nigel Mansell taking third place, but right behind him at this point was Ayrton Senna coming back from that tenth place after the pit stop and about to make a classic manoeuvre on Mansell to go through into fourth position, Ayrton Senna, on lap 55. Nanini was having a terrific race. Patrese had been doing a selfless job of riding shotgun for his teammate, but the Benetton's claims were too strong to resist, and Nanini was passed on the next lap. Ayrton Senna in his McLaren on fresh rubber continued his hard charge through the field, moving up to third place at Patrese's expense. Ricardo Patrese now on worn tyres and in a bit of trouble. So fourth was Patrese, fifth Nigel Mansell still in there, and sixth Gerhard Berger caught up as well on this very tight track indeed. As Mansell had another go, but Patrese was forced to come into the pits for fresh rubber. Berger was getting the best out of his new tyres, and this was already becoming one of the best races of the season, and the duel between Berger and Mansell typified the excitement involved. The Austrian came first blood to take third place, but Mansell wasn't about to let that one go. He pulled out all the stops to put Berger back in his place. Then came the first of two controversial incidents. Senna went for a gap that Nanini insisted wasn't there, and the Italian was launched out of the race. Incredibly, Senna survived to take second position, but the replay shows Nanini had more than a little cause for complaint. This dangerous manoeuvre nearly landed Nanini on his head. Then, at exactly the same spot, Berger tried to get past Mansell in the same way. This time, both cars were out of the race, although Berger had enough power to get back to the pits afterwards. Mansell's frustration was obvious for all to see. Perhaps it was just as well he didn't have to share the walk back to the pit lane with his former teammate Berger. The collision reduced the battle for the lead to a dogfight between Bootsen and Senna. It was nail-biting stuff for the Williams followers as the Brazilian hounded the leader right up to the flag. But Bootsen's skill lasted him to the line and he claimed his first victory of the year to the delight of the mechanics lining the pit wall. Renault had made a major effort in Hungary, even supplying special qualifying engines, and it had paid off. Bootsen survived the pressure from Senna to win, Piquet was third and Patrese fourth. Derek Warwick was a creditable fifth for Lotus. Afterwards, Bootsen was asked how hard it had been to keep them all at bay. Quite difficult, uh, but I must say for the first half of the race I was just controlling it. I had Gerhard behind me, about a second and a half behind me. And uh, I was just driving at his speed to conserve the tyres, to try to go as far as we could with, uh, with the tyres of the race, especially because I had quite a lot of oversteer from the beginning of the race. After that, there was a little bit of, of gap, five, six, seven seconds with the next one, but then the gap closed very quickly because my rear tyres had gone off completely and I just I was sliding very, very much and I tried to keep Ayrton behind as much as I could until the last lap and it was a right to cross the finish. I don't think I could have done one more lap in front of him. I'm very happy for the result. I think um, I was not expecting for sure to be in the top three here before coming to this race. I was expecting the two Ferraris to be very strong. And of course, in terms of championship, second place for me, with the other results, the other six places is perfect. High in the hills of the Ardennes lies the town of Spa, centre for an annual pilgrimage for Belgian motor racing fans. The Belgian circuit is a favourite amongst the drivers. Even the best of them could find it a little too challenging. Nevertheless, McLaren were happy to have secured Ayrton Senna's signature on a new contract. Any driver wants to be in the best team, to have the best car to win. And as long the team believes that I can, I can do the job for them, and as long it's reciprocal, same feeling, there is no reason for changing. Ayrton's a very complex uh, individual, and uh, we have a great attention to detail in the, in, in the document that 
constitutes the agreement and therefore it just took a long time to get every single part right. Uh, but um, we're very happy with the outcome. Senna was lucky to escape further disaster as he attempted to get back on course. At the same bend, Donnelly's Lotus lost a wheel, which bounced off the Brazilian's car. Berger made it a McLaren 1-2 on the front row, despite turning his machine into a stock car through the chicane. Prost was fastest in the Ferrari on Saturday morning, but he couldn't maintain his edge in the afternoon, dropping to third place. Home favourite Thierry Boutsen was trying for two wins in a row. In the end, he took fourth place on the grid, while his boss was speaking about William's role in next year's driver move. We are in discussions with drivers. I don't see any reason to rush those discussions. I can't say with whom these discussions are taking place, but um, in due course, we'll make decisions and then announce them. I mean, is it wild speculation to say that uh, Nigel Mansell could still be in the picture? I think it's fair to say that whilst discussions are going on, it will be improper to mention any names. You wouldn't, Frank, but we did. Mansell was still very much a Ferrari man. He complained of a tired engine on Saturday and slipped from fourth to fifth place on the grid. Ligier won an early reprieve from the trials of pre-qualifying following the announcement of the withdrawal of the Monteverde team, reportedly over a row over money. Spa was also the home race for Bertrand Gacho in the Coloni. He made it through pre-qualifying, but not into the grid itself. Despite the high prices, the grandstands were full on race day, but the crowds were going to have to be patient. Many have criticized the Formula One start at Spa, which leads straight into a hairpin. The critics were to see their complaints justified in the opening minute as Piquet's Benetton went sideways under braking and pushed Mansell's Ferrari into the rails. The Lotuses had been involved too. Warwick had taken to the grass to avoid the confusion up ahead, and then he was hit by teammate Donnelly, who had himself been shoved. There were some concerns for Nigel Mansell as he held his wrist in the cockpit of the Ferrari, and the marshals attended to him, but he got out OK. Up front, Senna sped off into the distance, unaware that still more carnage meant the red flags would have to come out. Modena had ripped a tyre on impact with Nakajima's Tyrrell, and sure enough, the race was stopped. Two more drivers for T-cars, please. Start number two appeared to be faultless as Senna made the best of his pole position to pull away from his teammate and the close attentions of Prost and Bootsen. There was a spot of bumping and grinding at the source, but everyone seemed to have made it round, and Bootsen, having made a brilliant start, was up into second and hassling Senna for the lead, ignoring Berger's pincer movement. But it was all to no avail after Barilla crashed heavily at Eau Rouge, completely destroying the Minardi in the process. The Pasta Air escaped with only minor injuries. It wasn't a happy day for the Minardi team. Their other driver, Pierluigi Martini, span after the second start, taking Andrea de Cesare's Dallara with him. Amazingly, both survived to take part in start number three. Out came the oil and red flags with debris and lubricant littering the track. Barilla's Minardi had left a gaping hole in the armco. As the marshals and organizers worked overtime to try and get the event back on schedule. Start number three. Donnelly, having commentated for the BBC on start two with Warwick in the T car, had managed to get back in his original car, this time after sterling work by the Lotus mechanics. Again, Senna led into the hairpin. Berger maintained the McLaren 1 2 this time with Prost and Bootsen forced to hold their grid positions. Then came Patrese and the Benetton pair with Nanini ahead of Nelson Piquet. Mansell was ninth, passed by Alesi's Tyrrell, and Guzelman took Nakajima's Tyrrell to move into 13th position. Mansell pitted on lap 11, complaining wildly about oversteer on the car which had been set up for his teammate. He dropped from 10th to 16th place and retired for good eight laps later. The camera on board Bootsen's Williams gave a good view of Prost's move past Berger on lap 14 to take second place. Soon afterwards, Berger pitted for fresh tyres, which handed the Belgian third place. Patrese's race came to an end with a dud gearbox on lap 18. And a miserable home Grand Prix came to a premature end for his teammate three laps later. Again, the gearbox was to blame. The race was between the men at the head of the championship race. 
They both pitted with tyres on lap 22, and it became a duel of the pit crews. But Senna rejoined in first, while his rival lost out on second to Berger. But Senna only just held on to his lead, squeezing out in front of Nanini. For the second race running, the Benetton driver was proving to be the race leader's major headache. But Alain Pross was the man with most to gain from overhauling Ayrton Senna, and he started out on his challenge for the lead by removing Nanini from second place with a copybook manoeuvre going into the bus stop chicane. Nanini on his original tyres had been trying to go the full distance. Gerhard Berger thought he would follow Prost's example shortly afterwards, and for a few seconds it looked as though he'd got away with it. But the young Italian belied the baldness of his tyres to reclaim third position almost before he'd lost it. The pair provided the best entertainment of the race from then on in, as Nanini fought to maintain his advantage on old rubber. On lap 41, he almost lost the Benetton completely at Eau Rouge, and the loss of momentum handed Berger third place. Up ahead, Senna had never been troubled by his Ferrari rival. He drove comfortably to the 25th win of his career, his second race in a row, and a further dampener to Ferrari hopes of resting McLaren's crown. Senna now had five wins to Prost four with the battle as hot as ever. On the podium, the absence of feeling between Senna and Prost was evident, but at least Gerhard was in the mood to party. Now Ferrari hopes pointed towards the force of crowd power at the next race, their home event, the Italian Grand Prix. And Prost, trying to get to Monza as quickly as possible, had to be restrained by President Ballest himself. For most Italians, Monza ranked second only to the Vatican as a centre for religious worship. The faithful flock here to pay their respects to the car, which has become a symbol for all that's attractive about motor racing. But the other entrants for the Italian Grand Prix provide the early spectacle. Stefano Modena started the sideshow when his Brabham exploded dramatically at the entrance to the first chicane. That was also the scene of the most violent mistake of the day, committed by Aguri Suzuki as he started his flying lap. And flying is just how the LaRousse Lamborghini ended up before touching down lumpily in the gravel. The pit crew were none too impressed. Michele Alboreto asked the next question of the Italian safety facilities as he span his arrows into the dust at the third chicane. Gerhard Berger was out early to wrest pole position from his McLaren teammate Ayrton Senna. He seemed to be on course before he came across Modena at the first chicane. Apparently the Austrian thought the Brown driver could have done more to clear the track. With angry Berger's challenge over, the path was clear for the Ferraris to launch their attack. Alain Prost had been fourth after the first day, but despite being delayed by traffic, he moved into first place with a blistering lap of 1 minute 22.9 with five minutes of the session left and sent the Tifosi wild with delight. But he'd forgotten his Brazilian mate's perfect timing when it comes to qualifying laps. With just minutes left to run, he claimed the 49th pole of his career with a time nearly half a second inside Pross, and that after a morning spent mostly in the pits. Mansell had been second fastest overnight, but he couldn't improve on Friday's time and slipped back to fourth position on the grid. John Alesi's display rivaled Senna's for brilliance. He managed to claim fifth position in the underpowered Tyrrell. No wonder his name had been linked with Williams. Yes, Williams signed a contract with John Alesi on the 2nd of February, a proper English law contract. Conditional, however, upon his securing a proper and legal release from his present employer, Ken Tyrrell. Um, if that release comes into place, Williams have priority on his services. And I'm sure you are well aware that he would rather drive for Ferrari, which is perfectly understandable. But uh, we got there first, and we intend to stay there first at this moment in time. The conditions were perfect as the cars lined up before packed grandstands for the start of the race. Senna made the best of his 49th pole position, and Gerhard Berger used his new position as shotgun to steal Prost's second place. But he didn't have to try too hard, the Frenchman making a terrible start in front of his team's home fans. The rest of the pack followed through smoothly enough, although Emanuele Pirro chose to perform a motor-powered ballet in the Dallara, mercifully without involving anyone else. Prost had been having trouble since the green light with Alesi, and the Tyrrell soon moved into third place at the champion's expense. Most of the field had completed lap one when disaster befell Derek Warwick at the exit of the Parabolica. The Lotus driver lost control of his machine as he tried to re-enter the pit straight. Instead, he careered into the Armco and ended up back on the track upside down. 
The accident looked horrific, and for some of the older fans watching, it seemed a terrifying reminder of the crash which claimed Jochen Rind's life at the same circuit 20 years earlier. The red flags were a formality, the crowd happy to see Pross get a second chance. Warwick, meanwhile, had had a miraculous escape. He crawled out of the car to start his run back to the pits and the tea car. But what had been going through his mind when the accident happened? Oh, many things, really. Uh, oh, shit, things like that, really. <laughs> um, as soon as the thing uh, escaped me, uh, it was obviously it was going to be an accident, and I knew it was going to be a big accident. So you really just brace yourself, ready for the impact. Um, the first impact, I remember seeing the, uh, the front left wheel going over my helmet, um, and then the car went on its side and was going along the barrier, and then coming out onto the race circuit. And although it only took maybe four or five seconds, it actually seemed to take four or five minutes. Uh, because I just kept on going and going. Um, I got out of the car, I looked straight over to make sure there was nothing else coming to hit me so I could get out of the way. I then walked to the grass and during that walk I, I'd sussed out that the car was obviously finished. Um, it was in the middle of the track so therefore they had to stop the race. The red flag still wasn't up at this stage and to get to the spare car because I didn't want to start from the pit lane. I'd rather start from my grid position. And I thought if I got there quick enough, i get into the car and out and onto the grid um, before, before the, the, the pit exit closed. Start number two bore a marked similarity to the first version with Senna rocketing in the distance. Bridesmaid Berger happy to follow in his wake. But again, Alain Prost had been reduced to third place, and again, Jean Lazy was harrying the older Frenchman all the way as the field filed through the first chicane in relative peace and order. Just a bit of smoke on the inside, and Senna was away into the lead. Prost saw his fears over a Lazy confirmed as the younger Frenchman claimed that third position for the second time in a row. So the first lap saw Senna leading from teammate Berger with a Lazy defying the odds in third position. But the young Frenchman's eagerness was to get the better of him. He lost the back end of the Tyrrell at the first chicane on the fifth lap and slammed out of the race. Once again, inexperience had put pay to Alesi's chances. Now the race order had a more familiar look about it, with the two McLarens heading off the challenge of Prost Ferrari. But Berger was having no luck with his car. Persistent brake problems slowed him down and gave Prost an easy chance to take second place, much to the delight of the Tifosi. Meanwhile, chaos in the Benetton pits as Piquet arrived to find teammate Nanini already in the service bay. He decided to wait it out rather than go round again. It had been a comfortable race for Senna despite the inconvenience of starting twice. He delivered a slap in the face to Ferrari fans at the race where it hurt most. Another nine points then for Senna, Prost making do with six points for second place, Berger third, Mansell fourth, Patrese took two points for Williams, and a great result for Nakajima, who took sixth place for Tyrrell. Prost was in conciliatory mood after the podium celebrations, actually shaking hands with his bitter rival, making it up, albeit temporarily. And although Senna had pulled clear a little bit in the points, mathematically, the Ferrari driver was definitely in touch, as the results showed. Senna and Prost just 16 points between them are well clear of the third place battle. And at three-quarter distance in the season, a different story in the Constructors' Championship. McLaren 37 points clear, continuing their dominance of the team race for points. On to Resteril and the first part of Formula One's annual Iberian excursion, the Portuguese Grand Prix. They speak the same language, so the local girls are naturally fans of F and Senna but the red flags of Ferrari are just as powerful a force here as everywhere. The mood seems relaxed around the Ferrari pit as Mansell and Prost share a joke which team boss Cesare Fiorio appears not to get. Perhaps Mansell's in a good mood because he's secretly planning to shelve his plans to retire at the end of the year. Um, you give me a car which is reliable for next year with an engine as quick as anybody else's, but not quicker, just as quick, and a very good team behind me uh, with number one status in the team I might reconsider my position maybe but that isn't possible at the moment so don't worry about it I'm going to retire <laughs>
Mansell's replacement at Marinello has finally been announced, the French pupil stands before the professor. Jean Lazy is of Sicilian stock and the lure of the prancing horse has proved too strong. I feel uh, very well because uh, it was a very hard uh, job. We, uh, we found a solution uh, uh, with Ferrari and um, now I'm very happy to have this contract for next year. But I still very concentrate on my uh, drive with uh, Tyrell because uh, I have uh, four races to finish and I want to, I want to finish very well because I have the possibility to finish well. Tyrell has been quick to find a replacement for the young Frenchman, as Bob Tyrell explains. Yes, well, we're absolutely delighted. Stefano Modena, the young Italian driver, is going to be driving for us next year, uh, along with Satoru Nakajima. And we wanted to make a, we wanted to, to get him signed up quickly because we wanted to end any uncertainty or speculation about who was going to drive for us. And what we were looking for was a driver with a combination of experience, but somebody who has the potential of being something really great. And we think that in Stefano, we've got a driver that has those two essential qualities. Obviously disappointed that uh, Jean Lays is leaving you there. Yes, of course, we would, we would like to have continued with Jean. But of course, when, when uh, a young Italian, uh, when a young driver of Italian descent, of Italian origins, has the chance to drive those red cars, it's quite difficult to, it, from an emotive viewpoint to, uh, to persuade him not to do that. Come race day, it was an all Ferrari front row with Mansell sitting on pole position. But one of the worst starts of the Englishman's career saw him risk putting his own teammate out of the race and allow the two McLarens to move from third and fourth position to the two top places. As the Ferraris chased hard to regain their advantage, it came as little surprise to discover the identity of the first man to crash out. Andrea de Cesaris got it all wrong as the pack headed out towards the back of the track. He disappeared into the sand trap, never to re-emerge. As the race order settled down, it was Senna leading from teammate Berger and the two Ferraris of Mansell and Prost. The twists and turns of this small little track gave the Ferraris an edge over the McLarens. Even so, Mansell's eagerness to get back in front nearly cost him dear as he went into the rough. Instead, it meant he and his teammates swapped places. With his tyres suffering after their trip across the kerb, Mansell was the first to enter the pit lane. Despite sterling work from the Marinello boys, he screamed out again, having dropped from fourth to fifth position. Senna was hemmed in by traffic and opted for a stop at the pits as Prost dived past Berger to take the lead. The McLaren mechanics were as efficient as usual, and when the Brazilian rejoined the fray, he had a clear road in front of him. But he'd handed the lead to his greatest rival, Alain Prost. The Frenchman didn't hold the upper hand for long. He too came in for tyres, and it wasn't one of the Ferrari crew's best efforts. He rejoined the race down in fifth position. All that handed the lead to Berger, but his ascendancy was temporary. It lasted as long as his pit stop. With all the stops over, Senna was back in the lead, but he'd been harried by Mansell all the way, and in the end allowed him past on lap 50. A typical gritty drive from Mansell then, charging on as ever, but in front of him, clumps of back markers and a hazard in the making. One of them nearly cost him the race. Philippe Alio claimed he was dicing with Martini when Mansell was trying to lap him and didn't notice the race leader in his mirrors. The two cars touched wheels and the Frenchman was sent careering into the barriers. On reflection, Mansell was lucky to escape with no damage to his car, while Alio was fortunate to avoid personal injury. Apparently unfazed, he paused to sign autographs on his way back to the pits. For a time, Senna's second position looked in danger as Prost overtook his teammate Berger to appear in his mirrors, but the Brazilian found enough power to keep his enemy at bay. He had enough because the race was destined to end early. Alex Caffey had been dicing with Aguri Suzuki for 11th place, and the two touched and Caffey had ended up hitting the barrier nose first at high speed, dazing the Italian who suffered a sprained ankle. Suzuki too was out of the race, although the Japanese driver was able to make his own way back to the LaRousse pit. The stewards had no choice but to bring out the red flags and so hand Mansell his first victory of the season. A useful second place went to Senna with Prost third and Berger fourth, as Mansell explained his best charge of the year. 
Well, you, you have to have a race for your life because either side of me are, are world champions and you can't beat world champions <laughs> unless you drive very hard. But uh, it was a great race and a very mature race and uh, as I said earlier, I'd like to go on record to thank Ayrton because uh, although we were racing very hard, he, um, he let me go past him after I got a good slipstream at the end of the straight. He could have fought with me, but uh, I saw him point and uh, it was a very good manoeuvre and very safe for both of us. Mansell and Senna showed what a difference a year can make as Nigel hugged his former enemy, while Prost was clearly demoralised in defeatist mood. Uh, nothing to say except that was uh, maybe one of the most unlucky races I've done in my, in my career. No, I'm think, thinking uh, any more about the championship. No. For me, uh, I think Ayrton won today. The championship will be over when mathematically is finished. It's still open and uh, I will just keep on going the same way I have done so far and we have to wait and see. The track at Jerez is stamped on the Spanish plane like a firebrand and the Andalusian heat was as fierce as ever for the 14th race of the season. One incident marred the whole race. Martin Donnelly lies like a mangled puppet in the middle of the track. With eight minutes of Friday's qualifying session left to run, his Lotus had collided with a barrier behind the paddock at 170 miles an hour. His car had split in half and the Alsterman had been thrown clear, the remains of his seat still strapped to his back. The wreckage bore testimony to the ferocity of the crash, which left everyone at the track in humble mood. You know, when someone escapes from an accident uh, as that, uh, obviously uh, there's other people involved that helped him survive that day. Obviously uh, the good Lord was really looking after us, I think, because anybody that survives an accident that big um, is just a miracle. Donnelly had been seriously injured with two broken legs and internal injuries. He was then flown to the neurological unit at a Seville hospital. Back at the track, Liget had announced the signing of Thierry Bootsen from Williams. The Belgian would join the team in time for next season, and by the sounds of things, he was looking forward to the challenge. Everybody is very, very enthusiastic. They want to go racing for winning again, and that's fantastic. I found something totally different from what I had at Williams and a uh, different atmosphere, different kind of people. And that's, for me, it's, it's something fantastic. I will be involved in a lot more work than what I'm doing at the moment. And that's also something I wanted to do. The German driver, Bernd Schneider, was standing in for Alex Caffey in the Arrows. Caffey still recovering from his crash in Portugal. Schneider's rustiness was soon in evidence. He didn't spot Alain Prost in his mirrors and gave the Frenchman no option but to hit him from behind. In the McLaren pit, there were celebrations as Ayrton Senna won his 50th pole position. The emotion on his face, all too obvious. Despite the previous night's thunderstorm, the humidity was as heavy as ever come two o'clock. Senna made the perfect start with Prost and Mansell holding second and third places. A charging Gerhard Berger forced John Lazy wide as Patrese hit the Frenchman from behind and off and out went the Tyrrell very early on. Berger survived unscathed and had a clear view of the race ahead. Senna in front, Prost second, and Berger fourth, with Nigel Mansell ahead of him. It was a tremendous scrap, but the replay revealed the Austrian's guilt. He gave Patrese no option, and a race that had promised much ended in disaster for Tyrrell's rising star, Jean Lazy. And you can see his left rear tyre is flat as he spins off into oblivion, his race only lasting a couple of hundred metres. Prost knew he had to beat Senna to stand any chance of retaining his championship. He also knew his Ferrari had the better of the McLaren around the twisting Spanish circuit, and he was pushing for all he was worth. Derek Warwick had shown true grit in deciding to race after Donnelly's accident, but a slow pit stop dropped him from 6th to 13th place. The Ferrari mechanics made a better job of the world champion stop. In fact, they were so efficient they managed to lay the way open for their man to take the lead. Prost roared out of the pit lane to rejoin the race in fourth position, but the McLaren mechanics were unable to match the boys from Maranello. Senna pitted a lap later, but despite the pit crew's desperation, he raced back into the event to find Prost was just going past him into the lead, having been waved past by teammate Mansell. This was exciting do-or-die stuff as Mansell did his best to fend off Senna, helping his Ferrari teammate as much as possible, and Senna came out of the scrap with third place. The pit stops had handed the lead to Nelson Piquet, but it had been a long time since the three-time world champion had led a Grand Prix. The Benetton team had persisted for most of the season in trying to complete as many races as possible on just one set of tyres, 
The increase in wear and decrease in traction made life difficult for the drivers. With old tyres, Piquet couldn't maintain the grip to hold off Prost, eventually running wildly wide to concede two places. Pierluigi Martini had been running 10th before a loose wheel nut caused him to spin out of contention. To prove the point, the wheel fell off as the crane got to work and bounced dangerously down the track, to the consternation, no doubt, of Olivier Griard in the Acela. Piquet's race came to an end on lap 42, a persistent electrical problem laying the Benetton low. Up ahead, Senna's attempt to regain his lead was starting to go wrong. Senna waved Mansell through, unaware that he had a hold radiator and stopped at the pits. The team didn't spot it and gave him new tyres instead. He carried on, only to pull off by the safety wall with a cooked Honda. The crowd loved it, Ferrari loved it, this was just what Professor Prost needed as the championship looked closer than ever. It wasn't to be a happy day for the McLaren team. Berger was harrying for Bootsen's fourth place. He made a grab for it at the hairpin and came a cropper when the Belgian closed the door. His race was over while Bootsen survived. Senna, forced into a rare retirement, spent several minutes sitting by his stranded car, apparently numbed by the shock. An exploded gearbox forced the brave Warwick out of the race in cruel fashion. Retirement no stranger to the Englishman, but this time it mattered more than usual. Up ahead, Prost sailed on to win as he wanted. It had been a miracle result, Prost gaining full points with Senna failing to score. The only result which could keep the Frenchman's hopes of the championship alive. And the race had been something of a vindication for Ferrari. Not for the first time they'd put a stop to McLaren's superiority with a 1-2 of their own. All of a sudden, Prost was back in the frame, just nine points behind, needing to win the last two races. McLaren were back under pressure, but Prost was happy with Ferrari's strategy. We have done a very good uh, team race today. Uh, drivers and the team, uh, the team itself, mechanics, and good pit stop. We stopped Nigel at the right moment. Maybe McLaren did not know what to do exactly about the tire stop. And uh, we have planned to stop uh, early if I was uh, second and uh, everything works very well and uh, Nigel helped me quite a lot because when I was uh, just behind him he let me he let me go and uh, that helped uh, I mean the, my rest I mean, was much easier like this and uh, I'm very happy about today after the problems last week I think it's a, it's a big good change. <laughs> East to Japan, and one of the most exotic races on the Formula One calendar. Japan is a land of contrast, from some of the most impressive scenery in the world, ranging from volcanoes to forests, with no one to be seen for miles, to some of the most congested and technologically advanced cities on Earth. The sport is a relative newcomer to Japanese society, but it's been adopted with a reverence unique to this part of the world. The big talking point at Suzuka was the helicopter crash which had robbed Benetton of their number two driver. Alessandro Nanini had had his right arm sewn back on after severing it in the accident. His replacement is a popular figure in the pit lane. Roberto Moreno was free because Eurobrun were not contesting the last two races. Japan was a golden opportunity for him to prove how cruelly he's been overlooked in the past. And Japan was Nigel Mansell's first race since announcing his decision not to retire at the end of the season after all. He was going back to Williams, confident that the world title would one day be his at last. All I can say to you is, is that um, I'd like to officially on television uh, tell everybody how it was that even after the Spanish race, uh, the decision to retire was still there because um, Frank Williams was pushing very, very hard, obviously for, for a lot of weeks, if not months for us to reconsider, but I asked, uh, in his words, uh, I asked for the impossible, and he said it couldn't be done. I said, well, basically, um, you're the one pushing and uh, wanting me to reconsider. We're happy with the decision to retire, as you know. Um, but they did the impossible, and uh, it wasn't until 11 o'clock um, uh, on Monday uh, after the sp Spanish race that we had, uh, or they had everything in place to convince us. And uh, Renault has given me a personal undertaking as well that uh, they want to compete with Ferrari and um, with Honda. And to do that, they're going to put a lot more resources in and they're working incredibly hard. And you put everything together and with seeing the new car, which is very different, um, they have persuaded me and certainly made me believe that they do have a package together which is um, 
certainly uh, worthy of another try. With Martin Donnelly still on the long road to recovery after the horror of Jerez, Johnny Herbert, the Lotus test driver, stepped in as replacement. His ankle's now fully mobile after his 1988 accident, and he had a point to prove. Alex Caffey had fully recovered from the accident which brought the Portuguese race to a premature end. The Footwork Arrows driver was on hand to show off the new Porsche engine, which will power his car next season. He and Michele Alberto both re-signed from 1991, although the 1990 Footwork Arrows has been a disappointment. Another new engine was on show. Brabham were proudly displaying the power unit which should revive their fortunes next season, a new V12 supplied by Yamaha. Disaster befell Jean Lazy on Friday. He careered head-on into the tyre wall at the first corner, rupturing his neck muscle in the process and ending his involvement in the Japanese Grand Prix. So Senna led the cars on the parade lap after the 51st pole of his career. The Ferraris were second and third. Prost alongside Senna on the front row. Almost at home here, the Brazilians' pre-race comments were to prove prophetic. Japan is a place where I have uh, the biggest number of fans after Brazil. And it's a special atmosphere here. And uh, Championships have been decided here over the past few years. And hopefully another one will be decided here. At the green light, Senna soon lost his advantage to Prosperari. The Brazilian had campaigned in vain all weekend to have Pole move to the cleaner side of the track. The controversy came when Prost in the lead appeared to go wide at the first bend. Senna didn't wait to see if the move was a temporary one and went for a gap which soon disappeared. The result was catastrophic. The pair clambered out of their cars and into the dust cloud, neither talking to the other, but the 1990 world title had been decided in a matter of seconds. A first look at the replay laid the blame squarely at the Brazilian's feet. Prost had shown him a clean pair of heels and it looked as though Senna deliberately caused a collision. Perhaps he was all too aware that Prost could not become world champion if he failed to finish the race. But whether there was a gap or not, Senna was now the new world champion, albeit not in the most glorious of circumstances. To be fair to Senna, there was a gap, but back in the race, Berger was leading from Mansell. Berger seemed to have the race at his mercy when he span off at the same spot as the opening crash, possibly spinning on his teammate's oil. Mansell then led from the two Benettons of Nelson Pico and Roberto Moreno, who must have been revelling in the new power beneath his right foot. The race roared on as Senna and Prost cars were laid to rest by the side of the track, a sad monument to an unsatisfactory conclusion to a battle which had raged all season long. The new world champion was unrepentant, so too was his boss, Ron Dennis. Uh, Ayrton Senna, I've heard that you've uh, recently run the World Championship. Have you got something to say about this? It's over. Uh, I think uh, for sure I want to win the race today. In the same way I won in 88 to win the championship. Unfortunately, it went wrong on the first corner. There was a big risk. Uh, I had uh, nothing to lose on the first corner. I want to win and I went for a gap in inside on the first corner. Alan didn't, didn't see it and just closed the door and we ended up touching. That's too bad for the championship because I'm sure the race would have been a lot full of excitement. But uh, last year I lost in a similar manner towards to the end of the race instead of the beginning. And this year went wrong for him. In a race like this, where you're fighting for the championship, you have to go for everything. And as it happened in many other occasions in, in the past, there have been accidents in the first corner. I was on pole, uh, I Prost did a better start, but on the first corner I was coming faster than him, I had a better engine acceleration, and there was a gap. I went for it, he closed the door, and then was nothing I could do to avoid the, the contact. If he had not closed the door, nothing would have happened, and we would have continued uh, racing, but uh, unfortunately he closed the door and I could not avoid the contact. The home crowd was having an exhilarating effect on Aguri Suzuki and the LaRousse. Inspired, he roared past Derek Warwick on lap seven to take sixth place. And the significance of his home Grand Prix wasn't lost on Satoru Nakajima either. The roar of the crowd drowned the whine of the engines as he harried Johnny Herbert for eighth place. Lap 26, and Mansell surrendered a comfortable lead to pit for fresh rubber. The crew achieved the stop in under six seconds, but it was to no avail. The Ferrari's drive shaft snapped as Mansell hit second gear. His race was over, and there was no need to ask how he felt about it. 
All Mansell could do was beat the steering wheel in frustration. His misery, however, was Benetton's joy as the team celebrated first and second positions. Johnny Herbert gained early experience of how frustrating life can be for a Lotus driver. His engine failed him on lap 32. The Englishman stalked off as PK flashed past in first position. Meanwhile, Nakajima was continuing on his samurai way, pushing past Warwick on his way to sixth position. Ricardo Petresi had hoped to complete the race on one set of Bs. He couldn't, and his stop put Suzuki into third place. The LaRousse driver was on his way to becoming the first Japanese driver ever to make the podium. Up ahead, it was just like old times for Nelson Piquet. He hadn't won a race for three years, and many had written him off as a has-been, only competing to pay the bills. Well, Japan put paid to that accusation. And with Moreno shadowing him home in second place, it made for some serious celebrations in the Benetton camp. So a glorious one-two for Benetton, an honourable third for Aguri Suzuki, which sent the Japanese fans wild, and Nakajima completed their ecstasy with six, but perhaps the happiest scene of the year came as Roberto Moreno came to rest in the Benetton. All the years of frustration seemed to evaporate as the tiny Brazilian collapsed in tears. Now things could only improve for one of Grand Prix Motor Racing's most underrated drivers. Well, I'm uh, I'm very happy because it's more than two years that, uh, or more than more than three years that I win a race, and also more than that, I'm very happy because uh, enjoying me my my old countrymate Alberto that start motor race together with me. I could enjoy the team and uh, finish second behind me and make me, me and the team very happy. Nelson certainly hadn't forgotten how to celebrate on the podium. Australia would be extra special this season as the race is the 500th ever event. But Alain Prost is a party pooper. He refuses to join the lineup for the driver's photograph. Still smarting over Suzuka, he believes Senna was entirely to blame for the accident. Absolutely, 100%. And I, I have, you know, a video here. From the helicopter, I have the video from uh, some people. Um, I think it's very bad, you know, to try to prove the things. But uh, I am a racing driver, a lot of experience, and uh, I never lie. I never lie to the to the press. I mean, very often it was against me because I said things were a bit rude, a bit a bit difficult to understand for a lot of people. But I never lie, and I can tell you he has done one hundred percent deliberately. That's what I don't accept. If there were only 1% chance, I would say, okay, there is a dude, but it is not even 1% because it was a, a corner where I'm flat, you know, in fifth gear, and the, on, the only way he could do something, he cut the corner and, and he hit my wing, the rear wing. So in fact, he did not hit my, the, the right wheel or the middle of the car, he hit my rear wing without touching the wheels. That means he just pushed me behind. So. And then from this time, I don't want to speak anymore about that, you know, because it's no, no value, no value for me, no value for the sport, for the team, for the Formula One. And I think it's, it's very bad. And Prost doesn't turn up for the portrait of former champions, among them the great Fangio, Jackie Stewart and Sir Jack Brabham. Despite the buzz about Adelaide, some seem to be just plain worn out and glad the season is all but over. Mansell was a little more alert as he lined up to take third place on the grid behind Senna and Berger. Once again, Senna made the perfect start. Unlike his teammate who relied on the McLaren's superior engine power to make up for his mistake, Prost had a terrific getaway from fourth position, but he couldn't split Mansell and Berger. Lap two brought Berger's second mistake of the day. He was trying to adjust something on the dashboard when the McLaren bounced over a bump, pushing his hand onto the ignition switch, which promptly cut the engine. Mansell gleefully moved into second place. Already past Prost, Piquet's win in Japan had obviously fueled the former world champion's appetite because he proved the point by another great outbreaking manoeuvre on Berger, and this took him through into third position. The crowd were entertained by some aerobatics from Nicola Larini in the Ligier. Amazingly, Larini could continue. Riccardo Petresi had a huge moment at the first corner when Gianni Morbidelli's Minardi blew up in front of him. Consummate skill relieved the danger. On lap 43, Mansell span into an escape road without forfeiting his second place but losing ground on Senna. 
That was the Ferrari's way of telling him he needed new tyres. The pit crew rose to the task brilliantly, although he dropped from third to fifth place in the process. Berger, meanwhile, was on his way to mistake number three. He ran wide over a high kerb to let Prost through to third place. The first win of the year still to elude the Austrian. Then came the strangest of sights, Senna driving straight on at a corner and head on into a crash barrier. Later, the new world champion revealed he'd had a gearbox problem. No win to celebrate his second world title. For the second year running, Senna fails to finish the last two races. Getting the most from his new tyres, Nigel Mansell was by far the quicker of the Ferraris. Alain Prost acknowledged the fact and led his teammate through without a fight. Nelson Piquet hadn't stopped for tyres and at times it showed. At least the escape road was wide enough to let him rejoin the circuit proper without losing his lead. With eight laps to the flag, it was all Piquet versus Mansell. The former Williams teammates were putting on a grandstand finish worthy of the last race of the season, which kept the crowd enthralled up to the last minute. Mansell broke lap record after lap record as he closed on the Brazilian. No one knew whether he would catch his man and earn himself a fitting farewell to Ferrari. Behind them, Prost came close to ending his race early, running wide at the same corner as Berger and Piquet. The last lap, Mansell had but one hope left for the lead at the end of the straight, and he bravely went for it, but failed, the Benetton and Ferrari narrowly missing each other, and Mansell losing time as he recovered. The danger was over for Piquet, and he had a clear run to his second victory in a row, and third place in the Drivers' Championship. Few could have predicted an end to the season quite like this for the former world champion. Now the prospect of a fourth title looks eminently possible. So Piquet brings more joy to Benetton Hearts and a valiant second place for Mansell with Prost third, Berger fourth, Bootson fifth and Patrese picking up the final point for Williams. By now, Nelson's getting used to winning again. Well, I was very comfortable in 10 seconds in the front and I got a two big traffickers in the two laps in the road and Nigel closed about four seconds after that. And, uh, and after that, I tried to overtake people, make my tires a little bit dirty. I went straight to one of the corners, and Nigel closed up the rest. And after that, I started to go like hell. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, last lap, I got another traffic, got more than a four of me, and Nigel closed up the rest of the beat, and uh, needed the shit hit the fan. <laughs> Nigel, certainly a very exciting race for your last race with Ferrari. What about next year? Are you looking forward to your prospects with Williams? Yes, I think so. I think it's another new challenge. Uh, I think I'd like to congratulate, you know, Frank and uh, and what he's done. And um, you know, I've got no crystal ball, but we're here racing, and uh, we finished on a high note with Ferrari. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Ferrari and and everybody. Go on, yeah, it's very good. <laughs> the end to a season which had once again been dominated by the battle between Prost and Senna. A battle which will resume next year, and there'll be Nigel Mansell's attempt to at last win the world title, as well as the enthralling prospect of Jean Lazy in a Ferrari. From me, Tony Jardine, and me, Matthew Lorenzo, it's goodbye till next year.